This is the weirdest playlist. You prefer the classical music? This is the music I listen to. Um, the thing is, I could play like uh, <clears throat> Takashi Yoshimatsu or someone like that, but I'd be immediately flagged for it. Whereas this old 90s video game music, nobody seems to care about. All right. Well, now that that's over, I've got a couple free hours to go over this finally. It doesn't appear as if anybody else will be joining me tonight. Everyone seems to have dropped off the surface of the earth. Just fine by me, it means I can get this a little bit more quickly. But we'll see. No, nope, looks like it's just me. All right, let's do this. So in preparation for my, uh, well, is it a debate? I actually don't know if I have a moderator anymore, but my, uh, my engagement with uh, Liquid Zulu on Sunday, um, I am going over a bunch of libertarian stuff and it is fascinating and insane. And this was given to me, this link was given to me directly by Liquid Zulu himself, apparently Herein lies the secret. This is this is what makes it all come together. It all makes sense. That as well as the uh, introduction to uh, Marie Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty by Hans Hermann Hoppe. And I read uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's article from which he gets the Ethics of Argumentation. Maybe this makes it clear. I didn't find either of these things particularly compelling. I guess the question I would keep foremost in my mind as, as I'm going through this is, let's assume that this argument pans out logically. Let's say it's entirely coherent. Everything makes sense. Um, we can like fuddle about whether or not like there is a wide consensus on his use of terms, whatever. But let's assume for argument six that they are. What's the upshot? Does the argument give us a reason to care? That's what I'm looking for here. So, let's see. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. At repeated requests from Many of my friends, Goodness, that's quiet. And, uh, given my already advanced stage in life, I have thought it was would be appropriate to take this opportunity to speak a, a bit about myself, not about private life, of course, but about my work and not about all of my uh, all the subjects. And there are quite a few to which I think I have made some little contribution in the course of the years. But on one subject, the one subject I consider my contribution the most important one, namely the a priori of argumentation as the ultimate foundation of law. So in previous years, I have given more uh, uh, fiery speeches and also a little bit funny stuff. Um, this time, um, I'm afraid it will be what on Saturday night would be called deep thoughts. Um, so you will have to suffer a little bit through all of this. I hope you will benefit a little bit nonetheless. Um, I developed the central argument during, my, uh, during the mid-80s when I was myself in my mid-30s. And not from scratch, of course, I took up ideas and arguments that were previously developed by others, in particular by my first principal philosophy teacher and Dr. Vater Jürgen Habermas. Sorry if I'm yawning throughout most of this, by the way. I'm not actually bored. Um, ironically, I was trying to sleep earlier because I couldn't sleep at all last night. Um, and I, I guess up till now, I still have not yet been convinced of the NAP. And even more importantly, by Habermas, long-time friend and colleague Karl Otto Apel, as well as by the philosopher-economist Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. In any case, however, the argument that I ultimately developed appeared to me essentially new and original. 
around the same time, I must say, Frank van Dunn, uh, living in Flanders and writing in Dutch and having been brought up under entirely different philosophical circumstances and traditions, had come up with a very similar argument and conclusion, yet at that time, we both did not know of each other's work and would only find out many years later. In a nutshell, and I'll come back to a more detailed explanation shortly, the argument runs like this. First, all truth claims, also all claims that given... Here, hang on, let me pull up a document. Let's do this proper. <sighs> That'll do. Okay. All right. So all truth claims. Oh, why can't you see anything? Oh, I see what's going on. Hang on. There we go. That's better. All right, there we are, okay. A proposition, that a given proposition is true or false or indeterminate or undecidable, or that an argument is valid and complete or not, are uh, raised and justified and decided upon in the course of an argumentation. Second, that the truth of this proposition. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify that because that was ridiculous. That a certain proposition is determinate in some way. If anybody has an objection to this characterization, let me know. Or let's say that the the truth of a certain no, they're just they're just a certain proposition. Cannot be disputed without falling into a contradiction, because any attempt to do so would itself have to be come in the form of an argument. Hence uh any attempt to refute one would fall into a contradiction. Hence, the a priori of argumentation. Third, argumentation is not free floating sounds, but a human action. Argumentation is a human action. This is feeling familiar. Namely, a purposeful human activity employing physical means, at least a person's body and various external things, in order to reach a specific end or goal, namely the attainment of agreement concerning the truth value of a given proposition or argument. Fourth, that while motivated by some initial disagreement or dispute or conflict, concerning the validity of some truth claim, every argumentation between a proponent and an opponent is itself a conflict-free, a mutually agreed upon and peaceful form of interaction aimed at resolving the initial disagreement and reaching some mutually agreed on answer as to the truth value of a given proposition or argument. Okay, this, okay, hang on, hang on. Uh, hang on a sec. Hey, stop that. I clicked OBS for some reason. That was dumb. Um, mutual disagreement. Or finding the truth of some claim. 
Okay, two is what needs to be established. Establishing this is the crux of the uh, of argumentation ethics. Um, and it still doesn't do anything, but we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Four just seems patently false. Every argumentation between opponents is a conflict-free and peaceful mode of interaction aimed at resolving a mutual disagreement or finding the truth of some claim. I don't think that's true at all. Um, first of all, argumentation is almost definitionally agonistic, no? Like, it involves conflict. Um, it may, it may have some, like, mutual goal in mind. Um, but it's, hang on, I just got a notification on Discord. Is somebody wanting to come in? Oh. Okay, nope, we're not having bunny truth in tonight. Okay, um... Like, you may in a certain mode, um... Engage in argumentation, uh, for some mutual end, or, or some common end. But... But, for example, like, in this debate space, it's not uncommon for people to be very overt about the fact that they aren't speaking to their opponent. They aren't trying to convince their opponent, they're trying to convince an audience. And their arguments may not be um, for the sake of some some mutual end. Their arguments may be for the sake of publicly weakening their opponent. Um, or maybe to the end of uh, disarming their opponent through dishonesty. And it may be to the end, for example, like let's say in the case of uh, Athenian Assembly, um, they may be uh, arguing as a means to destroy each other's credibility for the sake of war. Not to find the truth of some claim. There may be, there may be no interest in the truth. Um, there may even be a conscious awareness on all sides that the goal isn't the truth of some claim. Um, but to establish through rhetoric the aesthetic preference of of some action which is which is different right i know the video is low in volume i i've turned it up as loud as i can get it, it it's for whatever reason just bafflingly low um as a standard so there's not a whole lot i can do about that like i have this thing at it can only go up to 2000 so can i go to 100 nope Yeah, that's it. I'll turn down my volume a little bit so you can balance it out. But that's that's about it. Something so obvious. And why had no one else discovered this seemingly elementary insight before? To be sure. Hang on, I think there was a number five. And hence no possibility for economic calculation of labor he had thought of it before one person the right to self own that either the proponent or the opponent is not entitled to the exclusive ownership of his body oh my god where did we skip from stupid thing able to act independently of one another and come to a conclusion on his own that answer as to the truth value of a given proposition there we go or argument fifth that the truth or validity of the norms or rules of action that make argumentation between a proponent and a, an opponent at all possible. That is, the praxeological presuppositions of argumentation cannot be argumentatively disputed without falling into a pragmatic or performative contradiction. Six, that the praxeological presuppositions of argumentation then, that is what makes argumentation as a specific form of truth-seeking activity possible, are too far... I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that down, hang on, God. This, this jargon is just ridiculous. I'm sorry. Praxeological presuppositions of argumentation then, that is what makes argumentation as a specific form of truth-seeking activity possible, are twofold. First, each person must be entitled to exclusive control or ownership of his own physical body, the very means that he and only he can control directly at will, so as to be able to act independently of one another and come to a conclusion on his own. 
that is autonomously. And second, for the same reason of mutually independent standing and autonomy, both proponent and opponent must be entitled to their respective prior possessions, that is, the exclusive control of all other external means of action appropriated indirectly by them prior to and independent of one another and prior to the onset of their argumentation. That's ridiculous. In uh, several of, I think, sir, I know at least one, I, I think in the Mino, actually, um, Socrates uh, engages with slaves in argumentation. Um, people who have no legal ownership or practical ownership of their bodies, um, who don't have autonomy of their bodies, are nonetheless able to engage in argumentation as a form of truth-seeking. That's silly. All truth claims are claims that a certain proposition is determined in some way. It's true or false, etc., etc. Any attempt to refute one would fall into a performative contradiction. No, no, it's not. This is a universal claim, but all, all, I, I mean, hang on, no, no, all truth claims. Oh, <sighs> fall into a contradiction. I don't think so. I think two would be difficult to establish. I think uh, refuting one would be difficult to establish because what you would be doing is making a truth claim that would be a part of the roster of truth claims that are claims of that kind. Um, but in and of itself, like I, I think, I think two is is correct in some way. But in and of itself, I don't think it actually bears the content that all truth claims, or it necessitates the content that all truth claims are, are claims that a certain proposition is determined in some way. That is to say, I don't think I don't think it follows from one. I think one needs to be established. That's what I want to say. I think I think one stands in need of uh, some form of argumentation. All truth claims are claims that a certain proposition is determined in some way. I mean, I think that's sort of like tautological, but we could, we can more or less discount these two. These don't mean anything. Um, argumentation is a human action, purposeful human action, employing human means in order to reach a specific end or goal. Every argumentation between opponents is a conflict-free and peaceful mode of interaction aimed at resolving. A mutual disagreement or finding the truth of some claim only if you define argumentation as this. But this doesn't seem true at all. Um, argumentation can be <laughs> basically a form of social warfare with the aim of eliminating other parties from from the uh, from the field. The truth or validity of norms of action that make argument possible cannot be argumentatively disputed without performative contradiction. Uh, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. Um, because again, the question concerns argument categorically. Now, your argument in that case, um, would be, uh, about the truth or validity of, of these norms of action. But, um... It's difficult to process. A, I'm I'm exquisitely tired right now. Um, but B, like the language is so it, it's it's dense while saying very little. It's sort of like um it's sort of like reading Ayn Rand in a way, where she'll just say stuff. She'll just make declarations, and before you have time to unpack them, she's moved on to following from those declarations, and you're kind of blindsided by it. This <sighs> will kind of be arguments. He's going to have to elaborate on this because I don't I don't know exactly what the norms of action are here. I have a description of argumentation. I have a description of I have a description of argumentation, uh, which I dispute. At least common use doesn't seem to agree with this. But I don't I don't have the norms of action yet. And what's make what makes argumentation as a specific form of truth seeking possible are that each person has ownership of physic of their physical body. So they can act autonomously of each other um, and engage freely in argument, I suppose, is the logic. 
and B, both parties must be entitled to their respective prior possessions. B seems superfluous. I don't see why on earth you would assume this. A doesn't seem to follow. You don't need uh, control of your body to have control of your speech. Um, having control of your body doesn't even necessarily mean you have control of your speech. Um, this, this, this number six doesn't seem to follow from anything that's been said. And seven, that any argument to the contrary that is... Oh the God, there's a seven white... Jesus Christ, man. Why are there so many steps to this? ...or the opponent is all here to and independent of one another and prior to the onset of their argumentation. And seven, that... Oh, wait, and it must be prior to the argument. Prior to... Prior possessions. Prior to argumentation. Okay. Any argument to the contrary, that either the proponent or the opponent is not entitled to the exclusive ownership of his body and all prior possessions, cannot be defended without falling into a pragmatic or performative contradiction. Because by engaging in argumentation, both proponent and opponent demonstrate that they seek a peaceful, conflict-free resolution to whatever disagreement gave rise to their arguments. What? Yet to deny one... Well, well, no, I could literally be arguing to the end that my opponent should be violently dispatched. Like, my argumentation can be a form of warfare. That doesn't follow. Like, um, what was the purpose of uh, Haas and and uh, Jealous Pickle debating um, Destiny and Dylan Burns last night. It wasn't for the sake of truth-seeking. It was for the sake of dispatching ideological opponents in real time, of embarrassing someone to physically weaken their influence. Hang on, I'm going to go back a little bit. I want to see the performative contradiction here. That either the proponent or the opponent is not entitled to the exclusive ownership of his body and all prior possessions cannot be defended without falling into a pragmatic or performative contradiction. Because by engaging in argumentation, both proponent and opponent demonstrate that they seek a peaceful, conflict-free resolution to whatever disagreement gave rise to their arguments. Yet to deny one person the right to self-ownership and his prior positions is to deny his autonomy and his autonomous standing in a trial of arguments. It affirms instead dependency and conflict, that is heteronomy, rather than conflict-free and autonomously reached agreement and is therefore contrary to the very purpose of argumentation. Well, no. My purpose for argumentation is what I deem it to be. Uh, you don't get to decide that because, in your view, argumentation categorically implies a need for a desire for peaceful resolution, which I don't hold, um, that therefore... Uh, that therefore there's there's a contradiction in me arguing with you and disagreeing with you. Um, I mean, attempting to make that bad faith move in and of itself uh, would stand as a. I mean, I mean, I I would take that as an indication that you are in fact trying to deploy um, a subtler kind of force in order to undermine the receptivity of the audience to to my actual argumentation. So. I think the proponent of this argument is in fact violating this argument. Right? It, it, it literally stands on wordplay. You've equivocated between argumentation and a... between an action and um, the, uh, the desired end of that action. You, you've made them essentially identical with each other, which is not the case. Nobody says that argumentation means a desire for a desire to reach a peaceful resolution or to reach the truth. That's why sophistry exists.
So this, this argument actually undermines argumentation by denying the autonomy of the participants. Seems to me. I'm not sure I'll use that in the debate, but that seems that seems to me like how I would interpret this. Sort of like how Liquid Zulu likes to bring up rape examples. Um, you're directly offending your uh, interlocutor. Uh, not to the end of finding truth, not to the end of a peaceful resolution. You're trying to put them on the back foot to make them seem weak. <sighs> As I said, I will explain these things in greater detail. When I had finally worked out this argument, I was actually struck by how simple and straightforward it was. I was almost astonished why it had taken me so long to develop and even more so, why no one else apparently had thought of it before. He kind of looks like a turtle, doesn't he? Yet then I thought of Ludwig von Mises and his famous argument concerning the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. Mises, incidentally, had worked out this argument also in his own mid-30s. In short, what Mises had argued was that the purpose of all production is the transformation of something, an input, that is less valuable into something, an output, that is more valuable, that is efficient and economic instead of wasteful production. That in an economy based on the division of labor, recourse must be taken to monetary calculation in order to determine if production was efficient or not, that input prices must be compared with output prices to determine profit or loss, and yet that no input prices exist under socialism, and hence no possibility for economic calculation, because under socialism all production factors are, by definition, owned by a single agency, namely the state, thus precluding the formation of any and all factor prices. When I had first encountered Mises' argument, I was immediately convinced. Yeah, I'm not paying attention to the Mises stuff. I'm only interested in the ethics of argumentation. My reaction was, wow, how obvious, straightforward, and simple. And also, why did it take Mises so long to state something so obvious? No, Mises is not generally well regarded amongst economists, generally. Um, he's only really read by Austrians, and Austrians are only read by Austrians. And why had no one else discovered this seemingly elementary insight before? To be sure, some historians of economic thought were eager to point out that some earlier authors had already hinted at Mises' argument. Terence, Terence Hutchison, for instance, discovered that there was even a glimpse of Mises' argument in Friedrich Engels, of all people. But this notwithstanding, it appeared to me a gross misrepresentation of intellectual history and the grave intellectual injustice to claim anyone but Mises as the originator of the argument and the man who had finished off classical Marxist socialism intellectually once and for all. As well, while perhaps not quite so... You, you notice how weirdly cult-like this speech is. Like he's, he sounds like L. Ron Hubbard talking about how um, he, he I, I don't know, uh, debunked psychology or something or refuted psychology or like Ayn Rand saying she like the the only the only ph philosopher who taught me anything was Aristotle like it's 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 dumb like it's it's a bunch of weirdly unjustifiably adulatory remarks towards a fringe theorist that nobody reads outside of this group uh this group which is not taken seriously outside of this group like it's surprising. The reaction to Mises' impossibility proof was also instructive, especially given that Mises' proof concerned a problem that at the time of his writing, in the immediate aftermath of World War I, had taken on enormous importance with the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia. But by and large, there was no reaction at all.
Uh, Titan says, uh, economics like biology involves complex chaotic systems and linear thinkers never fully grasp either. Yeah, that's why I have a hell of a hard time understanding economic theory. I'm going to have to get learned up on that by somebody at some point. Mises was simply ignored. And the continued existence of the Soviet Union and after World War II of the entire Soviet Empire was taken by most of the econom economics profession and large parts of the lay public as hey, can we get to the ethics of argumentation, please? That Mises was wrong or in any case irrelevant. Why are we talking about Mises? Economists such as Hayek and Machlup and Röpke and Lionel Robbins were immediately converted by Mises. They abandoned their erstwhile leftist leanings and became prominent spokesmen of capitalism and free markets. And a few prominent socialists such as Otto Neurath, Henry Dickinson, uh, Oscar Lange, tried to refute Mises' argument. But in my judgment, even Mises' early fans watered down, misconstrued, or distorted, and so, in any case, weakened Mises' original argument. And as for the socialist foes, they did not even seem to comprehend the problem. Indeed, even after Mises had systematically restated and further elaborated his arguments two decades after its original presentation in his human action, and even after the implosion of socialism in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when some socialists, such as Robert Heilbronner, felt compelled to concede that Mises had been right, they still showed no sign of having grasped the fundamental reason why. Now, the fate of my own argument was in many ways similar to that of Mises. Finally. Most certainly, given that we live today in an... That was the whole point of this This five-minute digression was, yes, just like this other Austrian kook um, who was actually a secret genius, my argument also was inexplicably not well-received because everybody who read it was clearly a socialist shill. An age of rampant legal <sighs> ethical relativism of... You think, like an economist who talks all the time about efficiency would care about, you know, like the amount of time he's wasting. Anything goes. And a world in which private property rights have been almost everywhere and universally transformed into mere state-granted or fiat property instead, my argument concerned a matter of some importance, for it implied a, refu a refutation of all forms of ethical relativism as self-contradictory doctrines. What? Positively, it implied that only the institution of private property in one's body and in prior possessions could ultimately be justified, whereas any form of... Oh, I, I, I gotta re-listen to that. ...importance have been almost everywhere and universally transformed into mere state-granted or fiat property instead, my argument concerned a matter of some importance, for it implied a, ref a refutation of all forms of ethical relativism as self-contradictory doctrines, and positively, it implied that only the institution of private property... All ethics is relative. Definitionally, the word ethos refers to the character of a thing and originally referred to the character of a polis and the kinds of citizens it produced. Morality has to do with universal... What is like a, a universal ought in some case, i.e. you always ought to do this. And the reason why in Kant you can't have a contradiction in a, a maxim that is you always ought must do this is because the, then you always, then, then you not always ought to do this. And that doesn't mean the, the statement can't be dormant. Like, for example, um, always help the poor doesn't become a contradiction because at some point you've helped all the poor and there are no more poor people left. Because then you just adjust it. Always help the poor when they are with you or something along those lines. Um... But you can also have that, like, within an ethical system. So it can be the case that you have uh, universal uh, statements that can be made um, that, uh, but, the, but the duty to which is predicated on being a certain subject within a certain ambience, right? You just specify it. But it, it, it's, it's always relative. Um, even at the level of, um, of like, the, um, the categorical imperative, um, that's that's just getting at like the 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 universal core of it apropos human beings because really like beyond that all you have is 
uh, a, a will towards the good because any particularization of it past that is going to be relative to the particularization. That's my that's my uh, non philosophy majors gloss on that. So that this this premise that um, ethical relativism is somehow self contradictory uh, is is nonsensical. Um, ethical relativism is is basically a fact unless you want to say that God exists and everyone is wrong. Property in one's body and in prior possessions could ultimately be justified, whereas any form of fiat property was argumentatively indefensible. In any, if anything, then and the notion of property is always downstream from the state. We don't have a notion of property outside of. Uh, some kind of collective situation in which property rights are respected and enforced by walls. It does, doesn't exist. Like, the notion of property is downstream of walls. Of things that are put up specifically to delineate between yours and mine, and which are protected by some kind of mutual body. My argument concerned a matter of even greater and more fundamental importance than Mises' proof did. Nonetheless, but not unexpectedly so, my argument too was largely ignored, but not entirely so. This has to be the most narcissistic lecture I've ever heard. Like, he's just going on and on about how his argument was so brilliant and how it was just... Like, nobody talks like this in academia. You're, you're expected to demonstrate, like, a modicum of humility. This shows that he doesn't take... The material seriously this is about aggrandizing himself so he's willing to take leaps and and make cheap moves to to accommodate that murray rosbart i'm particularly proud to say accepted my proof immediately as a breakthrough and so did walter block and stephen kinsella indeed only shorter after the shortly after the first english pr language presentation of my argument kinsella brilliantly supplemented and expanded it by integrating it with the legal theory of estoppel, that is, the legal principle that bars a party from denying or alleging a certain fact owing to that party's previous conduct, allegation, or denial. As well, several more or less friendly reviews and discussions of my argument appeared in print. A small symposium on my argument appeared in Liberty magazine with both supporting fans and critical or hostile foes. I replied to some of my early critics and their criticisms, but then, except for a few occasional asides, let the matter rest, not least because I was paid at the time to do economics and not philosophy. Some later critics, in particular Robert Murphy and Gene Callahan, who apparently accepted my libertarian conclusion but rejected my way of deriving at it, without, however, presenting an alternative reason for their own beliefs. They don't have to. If your argument falls, then arguing, then showing how your argument falls is sufficient. You're not required to, like, fill in the gap that you've artificially created to uh, fit your argument into. ...demolished by Stefan Kinsella, Frank Van Dunn, and also by Marian Ea Brazu. The debate concerning my argument continued, however, and has in the meantime reached a substantial size. Thankfully, Kinsella, Kinsella has documented and regularly updated the still growing literature on the subject. Now, it is not my purpose here to give a summary account and assessment of the entire debate. Instead, I want to take the opportunity to further clarify and elaborate on the elementary character and indeed the simplicity of my argument and along the way dispel some recurring misunderstandings. In this, I want to proceed in two consecutive steps. First, I will try to clarify Finally. the argument from argumentation itself. Are you okay there? You okay, Herman? And also the Hans? notion of ultimate justification, and on the same hand, of course, of ultimate refutation of all forms of relativism. And then, in the second step, I will try to clarify the specifically and decidedly libertarian implications that follow from the a priori of argumentation. The question of how to begin philosophy, 
That is, the quest for a starting point is almost as old as philosophy itself. In modern times, Descartes, for instance, claimed his famous cogito ergo sum as such a starting point. Mises considered the fact that humans act, that is, that humans pursue... That's, that's a history of philosophy, Descartes and Mises. ...anticipated ends with means, whether successfully or not, as such a starting point. The later Wittgenstein thought of ordinary language as the ultimate point of departure. Others, such as Karl Popper, denied that any such starting point existed and could be found. As a little reflection shows, however, none of this will quite do. After all, Descartes' cogito is a proposition, and its justification comes in the form of an argument. And likewise, Mises speaks about action as an ultimate datum and presents an argument, namely that one cannot purposefully not act to justify his point of departure. And similarly, Wittgenstein's ordinary language philosophy is not just ordinary talk, but claims to be true talk about talking. That is a justific justification argument. And as for relatives a la Popper, to assert that there is no ultimate starting point and yet claim this proposition to be true is plain contradictory and self-defeating. In short, Whatever has been claimed here as starting points, or even if the existence of such a point has been denied, they all unwittingly, and as a matter of fact, have affirmed the existence of one and the same point of departure, namely argumentation. And they could deny... Well, they haven't affirmed argumentation, they just deployed argumentation. And the argumentation isn't the move itself. The argumentation is the expression of it for the consumption of other people. Um, a, a mere stance that you hold is not an argument. You can hold stances that you don't argue for. Argumentation is the uh, public deployment of a stance and its defense. Right? At least it inevitably involves that. You're not, you don't have an argument just because you have a thought. That's ridiculous. These people aren't affirming argumentation as, as the basis of truth, either. They're simply deploying argumentation for the purposes of communication. They're not even necessarily arguing that that communication is, is always valid. Like, they may be speaking specifically to a particular audience, to a particular audience that they already believe is sympathetic to them. They may be, in a sense, speaking to themselves. This is... How do you even make this leap? This is, this is baffling. The argumentation, the status as the ultimate starting point only at pain of contradiction. Now, this criticism of other philosophers is not meant to deny some partial truths of their various contributions. Indeed, upon reflection, we can recognize that every argumentation is also an action. That is, a purposeful pursuit of ends with the help of means, leading back to Mises. But not every action is an argumentation. Indeed, most of our actions are not. Further, we can recognize that argumentation is a speech act involving the use of a public language as a means to communicate with other speakers, which leads back to Wittgenstein. Okay, but a speech act is distinct from the content of an argument, which may be true or false, whether or not it is locuted. Like, th these are separate. Um, in, in addition, like, a, a speech act can be non-felicitous. Like, you may, um, that, that's, uh, uh, shoot, what's his name? How to do things with words? Austin. That's Austin's uh, term for when a speech act fails to do what it's supposed to do, what makes it the kind of thing that it is. So, for example, um, if you say, uh, I do, you may fail to marry someone if you are not uh, before the appropriate person or staring into a mirror. Um, if uh, you say, I uh, sentence you to death, um, you uh, might not, that might not be a felicitous condemnation uh, if you are speaking to your chicken nugget, right? Like it's, it's, this is,
point is, you can additionally fail to locute your argument properly. Or, or you can fail to locute the thing that you, you want to locute. Or you can fail to affect the thing that your argument is supposed to do. You think he's still misusing Wittgenstein? I think he's misusing Wittgenstein too. I just I, I can't harp on everything, right? I'm letting him have his premises and I'm working with those. He's going to go on like a, a, a rabid polemic against a host of um, philosophers and misrepresent them violently. I, I can't address that. I'm concerned specifically with the argument itself. Because he's going to make some key errors, and those are what I want to pinpoint. Because the issue with Hoppe isn't his bad history of philosophy. The issue with Hoppe is that his own argument is in patent bad faith and rests on brute forcing some equivocations that we need to isolate and identify. But not every speech act is an argumentation. Indeed, most activities when we speak with each other have nothing to do with an argumentation. As well, what do you mean? recognize that every argumentation and by implication also every speech act and every action whatsoever presuppose the existence of an acting, speaking, and arguing person, which leads back to Descartes. But it is only from the vantage point of an arguing person that the distinction between actions, speech acts, the so-called lower functions of language, and argumentation as a highest function of language can be made and claimed to be true. And as for Popper and Popier... Wait, what can be claimed to be true? ...to Descartes. But it is only from the vantage point of an arguing person that the distinction between actions, speech acts, the so-called lower functions of language, and argumentation as a highest function of language can be made and claimed to be true. What? Presuppose the I, I, what the point of an arguing person that the distinction between actions, speech acts, the so called lower. The distinction between actions and speech acts and argumentation can be true? What? What? What does that mean? Functions of language and argumentation as a highest function of language can be made and claimed to be true. What does that mean? What, what like what does this get you? What what was the point of that? It's only from the vantage of an arguing person that we can assign the value lower to actions and speech acts and the value higher to argumentation. Sorry, it's only it's only in that it's, it's only from that vantage that we can claim that distinction to be true. Why does it have to... What do you mean true? Are you talking about the valuation? How does that follow? If you just mean the distinction, like, you, they're, they're different concepts. You, you don't need to justify the distinction. You distinguish them. Like, you... You... you was, you were talking about different things. Okay. And as for Popper and Popperian critics, it is certainly true that deductive arguments proceeding from premises to conclusions are only as good as the premises are that one can always ask for a justification of these premises and then of the premises of this justification and so on and on leading to an infinite regress. However, the argument presented here is not a deductive argument, rather it is a transcendental argument directed at the skeptic by pointing out that even he must and in fact does accept an ultimate truth simply in order to be the skeptic that he is. Thus, the skeptic would certain, thus a skeptic could certainly deny that humans act, speak, and argue, and claim instead that no, they do not, 
And in doing so, he would not become involved in a formal or logical contradiction. But in making this claim, he would be involved in a performative, pragmatic, or dialectic contradiction. But only because you specified that example which specifies human beings that argue. The logic doesn't follow under any other circumstances. That's the most spurious leap I've, I've ever seen. Uh, Kevin Thompson says, I think the easiest way to understand what he's trying to do here is the framework of revealed preference, quote-unquote. Economists, particularly early neoclassicals, presume that. I don't know what that means. If um, your activities reveal an underlying preference structure. I mean, your activities can indicate an underlying preference structure, but they don't reveal one. Um, preference Preferences are private. I may do what I don't prefer because I may have uh, some sense that the world is distinct from the world that you perceive. Like, I may think that I, I'm under a uh, serious threat of uh, death if I uh, air my opinions publicly, and so I may modify my presentation um, and my behavior to suit that, but that may not accurately reflect the case. And therefore, I don't, I don't do or act in accordance with my preferences. I do or act in accordance with my perception of the world, which may be distinct from you. It seems like only in a situation in which we all have like the same environment and the same perception of our environment that we could make some judgment about how our actions necessarily reveal our preferences because then everything else would be accounted for. But we, we don't have access to each other's preferences. Um, for example, I may argue in bad faith and may nonetheless argue validly uh, to the end, not of finding uh, some common uh, agreement or, or truth or, or to avoid conflict, but maybe to foment conflict, maybe to, like, like th these things do not imply each other. Because his words would be refuted by his actions, that is, by the very fact of claiming his words to be true. Argumentation, then, is a comparatively rare subclass of actions, and more specifically, also of speech acts, motivated by a unique reason and aimed at a unique purpose. It arises from interpersonal disagreement or conflict concerning the truth value of a particular proposition or argument, and I'll say more on the difference between disagreements and conflicts. Okay, so Ken Tomps, Kevin uh, clarifies uh, Hoppe's argument. Uh, your activities reveal an underlying preference structure and that by choosing to pursue argumentation over violence, you implicitly accept all the other things that must be true for that preference to exist. Uh, your criticism is right. Good. Good to know. Uh, for that preference to exist rationally. Okay, so I'm reading this correctly. Thank you for that, Kevin. I do appreciate that because one of the, um, one of the unfortunate facts about taking stuff seriously and being careful is that when you don't understand a thing or when argumentation is is vague, your impulse is not to go, oh, the source I'm listening to is wrong. It's to think, oh, I misunderstand it. But sometimes the source is wrong and it can be tricky to make that jump. <sighs> In a little bit. And it aims at the dissolution or resolution of this disagreement or conflict by means of argumentation as the unique... That's not true. I can argue for the sake of fomenting further argumentation or for agitating to further argumentation. Like, uh, here, here's actually one area where, um, where, where Peirce comes in handy because what Hoppe is doing with argumentation is what Peirce does with uh, methods of, of verifying our knowledge or fixing our beliefs. Um, like we, we, we are agitated by doubt, um, in order to try and fix our beliefs. And so to the extent that we are motivated to fix our beliefs to, uh, which is to say really not, not just to fix our beliefs, to, but to fix like a condition of belief. So we've assuaged our doubt. Um, we, we may deploy the, the, the most reliable and, and stable method for that would be, um, the method of science, which would involve, um, you know, honest argumentation to arrive at the truth uh, so that we can settle our doubt. Not to settle disagreement, but to settle our doubt about some fact that we think is important about which we are uncertain. But he's saying that the bare act of argumentation itself implies that agitation. But I may be, per I may be perfectly comfortable with my beliefs, and I'm doing so for dishonorable reasons. 
And what's he going to say? Like, that's not argumentation? Says who? Says you? You're not an authority on that. That framework was always meant to be a simplifying assumption for the sake of confirming when a rationality is present usually is what type of rationality is occurring in a given decision-making scenario. Uh, if you could elaborate on that, uh, Kevin, that would be helpful. Oh, and you're doing so right now. Brilliant. But certain economists take it as fact or as a necessary assumption we must make about the world. Early neoclassical traditions like Austrians implicitly do this with their action axiom. I haven't read Mises yet, so at some point, God willing, I won't, but maybe I will at some point and I'll, I'll have that logged away method of justification. One cannot deny this statement and claim such denial as true without actually affirming it by one's very act of denial. That is, without performative, pragmatic, or dialectic contradiction. Indeed, to paraphrase Fun Frank Fun Okay, let, let's think about this for a second. Let's assume he's right. And I dispute that he's right very strongly, but let's assume that he's right. Are you a libertarian now? Are you compelled by this? Ah, uh, you're 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 implying assent to my construal of property rights by making that argument. Therefore, you're a libertarian. No, you're not. What he pushes us to, if we allow him to is assent to inconsistency and uh you are allowed to be inconsistent what's he gonna say you can't be inconsistent really based on what based on what like oh oh it's unethical based on what Fun done to claim that you cannot or ought not to argue and take arguments seriously is to say that you cannot do what you actually are and claim to be doing. Which makes you a hypocrite, but doesn't establish the point that argumentation implies adherence to an ethic. It is like saying there are no reasons for claiming this or that to be true, and here are the reasons for why there are no such reasons. As well, as Van Dunn keenly observes, Hume's famous dictum that our reason is and ought to be the slave of our passions, while not a contradiction in adjecto, is in fact a performative or dialectic contradiction. For Hume gives reasons and pays serious attention to reasons while claiming that no attention should be given to them. To a neoclassical economist, the assumption is that humans are bad at knowing what they are really like or what they really want. Their behavior reveals what they truly are, and Hoppe will say that you cannot rationally agree or disagree with this point. Well, I will retort to Hoppe that um, maybe he's just very bad at knowing what people are really like or what they really want. In light of this insight into the nature and epistemological status of argumentation as a unique method of justification, many objections directed at my original argument can be easily No worries, discovered. Kevin. I appreciate your, uh, your it clarifications. It has been held against the argument from argumentation, for instance, that one can always refuse to engage in argumentation. Now, this is, of course, true, and I have never said anything to the contrary. However, this is not an objection to the argument in question. Whenever a person refuses to engage in argumentation, he is also owed no argument in return. He simply doesn't count as a rational person in regard to the question or problem at hand. He is treated as someone to be ignored in the matter. Indeed, someone always and on principle refusing to argumentatively justify any of his beliefs or actions whatsoever against anyone would no longer be considered and treated as a person at all. He would be considered and treated instead as a wild thing or an outlaw. Which is actually pretty consistent with um, how Austrians are treated in the academy today and for precisely that reason. Um, because they're not deploying a use of terms that allows conversance with other philosophers. Um, they are not engaging in good faith. So what they really are, are not uh, rational parties to a discussion. Um, they are uh, 
people trying to sneak in via a Trojan horse in order to do damage to the institution. His presence and his behavior would pose for us a merely technical problem. That is, he would be treated like a little child screaming no at everything said to him, and, or like an animal, that is, as something to be controlled, domesticated, tamed, drilled, trained, or coached. Another objection to my argument from argumentation advanced repeatedly and by several opponents in a seemingly most serious manner actually better qualifies as a joke. It boils down to the claim that, even if true, my argument is irrelevant okay. and consequential. Okay, here we go. Now, why? Because the ethics of argumentation, according to them, is valid and binding only at the moment and for the duration of argumentation itself, and even then only for those actually participating in this. No, but does anybody actually bloody retort this way? Like, that, that's, that's irrelevant. Now, curiously, these critics do not notice that this thesis, if it were true, would have to apply to themselves also and hence render their own criticism irrelevant and inconsequential also. Well, well, well no. Hang on, hang on. Their own, their own thesis. Have ...to apply to themselves also, and hence render their own criticism irrelevant and inconsequential also. Well, no, because you're trying to establish an ethic, right? You're, you're trying to establish that your interlocutor is a libertarian. Well, maybe they, they go into a libertarian mode to sustain that argument. But then they are no, not libertarians after the fact. Like, maybe there's an inherent, uh, maybe there's an inherent uh, implication of a libertarian stance locally to argumentation. Maybe. I disagree, but maybe. But that doesn't mean that they're therefore libertarians afterwards, they do other things in the world. That's not on them. They don't, they don't have to establish the permanency of anything. They just have to establish that you haven't established the permanency of your stance or, or of the, the, the permanency of the implication of your stance. Their criticism itself then would be just talk for the sake of talking without any consequence outside of talking. For according to their own thesis, what they say about argumentation is true only when and while we are saying it and has no relevance outside the context of argumentation. Jesus Christ, he's an idiot. Okay, so like what it actually, so what he's trying to argue is that in order to take part in argumentation at all, in order to argue any stance whatsoever, uh, you imply a valorization of argumentation as your preferred mode of engagement which he takes to imply that you seek peaceful resolution to conflict and the or and or the uh, finding out of the truth of some proposition. Um, ergo, anybody who argues against libertarianism uh, has actually revealed that they are in fact libertarians because he's he's offloaded all that baggage onto it. The counter that he's the counter that he's giving here um, is actually pretty good because what it points out is that well, really, like maybe they do in that moment. But that doesn't actually imply anything for whether or not they're libertarians or have any uh, need to be libertarian in any other domain of human action. Now, he retorts saying that, well, uh, they don't need to... Well, what exactly? What is the argument here? Well, your argument only applies for as long as you argue. Well, no, it doesn't. They're just trying to cancel... They're just trying to show how um, your claim that they are libertarian is limited to the point of being meaningless. Their argument doesn't need to surpass the argument their, their argument is only is only targeting that which is limited by the argument and moreover that what they say to be true is true only for the parties actually involved in argumentation this is also or true even only for them alone if and so far as there is no actual opponent and what they say they are just saying in an internal dialogue to themselves but why then should anyone waste his time and pay attention to such merely personal truths? Uh, because they, they may come loaded in addition with the power and influence to change things in the world for you.
because people are more than just their capacity to argue and talk. They also have arms and resources and communities and, and things that have a lot of force. More importantly, and to the point, in fact, these critics are, of course, not engaged in idle talk or a mere joke, but in serious argumentation, that is, in the presentation of something that they would call a counter-argument. And as such, and in this capacity, then, they become inescapably entangled in a performative or dialectic contradiction because they, what they actually do claim what they say about argumentation is true inside and outside of argumentation. That is, whether one actually argues or not, and that it is true not only for them, but for everyone capable of argumentation. That is, contrary to what they say, they actually pursue a purpose above and beyond the exchange of words itself. Argumentation is a means to an end and not an end in itself. It, it can be an end in itself. There are some people who have a fetish for argumentation. There are people who like to just go to conferences because they like the idea of being in an intellectual atmosphere and seeing arguments. The, the end can be argumentation itself or it could be the aesthetic of argumentation itself or some other like fall off thing that's uh, beneath the level of like an, a, a practical positive end to the argument. They may get something tertiary to it. In addition, um, what's he going to say after this? Is he going to specify like what that end is? Again, there are myriad ends you can have for argumentation. You can end, you can argue to the end of uh, fomenting agitation by presenting an argument against some commonly held position or against uh, some position that is is uh, you know sensitive. Um, you can argue to the end of discrediting an opponent. You can argue to the end of goading an opponent to embarrass themselves by laying bare positions that are integral to their position that are socially unacceptable. Um, none, none of this leads you, like the fact of argumentation does not lead you to the uh, signing off on an ethic in time. At best, what you can say is, uh, given like this, this weirdly specified notion of property in which we've equivocated between that and your very capacity to act and speak and make an argument, ergo, uh, 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 therefore, when you argue, um, you are affirming the fact that you can argue. Like, no shit. Well, well done, genius. Um, but that doesn't sign, that doesn't, uh, <laughs> that means absolutely nothing to getting you to affirm uh, libertarian property rights outside the, uh, outside the, the, the specific case at hand with that specific equivocation made. It signs it. It, um, it commits you to absolutely zero uh, libertarian ethical stances outside of that argument. Again, uh, only thus construed. It's this is just stupid. This is actually just stupid. It is the very purpose of argumentation to overcome an in initial disagreement or conflict regarding some rival truth claim and to change one's former beliefs or actions depending on the outcome of argumentation. That is, argumentation implies that one ought to accept the consequences of its outcome. No, it doesn't. Otherwise, why argue? Hence because maybe you argue with the expectation that you will win. This is why when people argue on Twitter, sometimes they delete threads when they're ratioed. It is a performative or dialectic contradiction to say, for instance, let us argue about whether or not minimum wage laws increase unemployment and then add, and then let us, regardless of the outcome of our debate, continue to believe what we believed beforehand. Similarly, it would be self-contradictory for a judge in a trial to say, let us find out who of two contending parties, Peter and Paul, is right or wrong, and then ignore the outcome of the trial and let Peter go even if found guilty or punish Paul even if found innocent. Well, no, the logic would be self-contradictory. Something about the judge would be revealed in that case. Um, it would simply be the logic of the court is contrary to the judge. But that doesn't mean that the, the judge is contradicting himself or herself or themselves. All that means is that 
uh, the the logic of the court is a farce. I think a way you could summarize this is that he makes the stronger claim that a quote-unquote norm is being presupposed in an argument rather than a preference in a decision-making scenario. Uh, I mean, insofar as we consider um, an argument, a state of argument to be like a normal situation, I suppose. But I think that's a pretty strong claim too, and I don't, uh, as you say, and I don't think that's necessarily one you can sustain. Um, it's some real giga chad brain to claim that anyone who argues with you already agrees with you. Now, I'm kidding. Equally silly, some critics have charged me for supposedly claiming falsely that the truth of a proposition depends on someone making this proposition. But nowhere did I claim any such silly thing. Certainly that the Earth orbits around the Sun, that water runs downward, or that one plus one is two is true, whether we argue about it or not. Argumentation does not make something true. Rather, argumentation is a method of, for justifying propositions as true or false when brought up for consideration. Likewise, the existence of property or prop and property rights or wrongs does not depend on the fact that someone argues to this effect. Rather, property and property rights or wrongs are justified when up for contention. Now, was this Hang on, I need to, to rewatch the last few seconds. The sun, that water runs downward, or that one plus one is two is true, whether we argue about it or not. Argumentation does not make something true. Rather, argumentation is a method of, for justifying propositions as true or false when brought up for consideration. Likewise, the existence of property or prop and property rights or wrongs does not depend on the fact that someone argues to this effect. Rather, property and property rights or wrongs are justified when up for contention. What the hell is a property wrong? Property rights aren't opposed to property wrongs. Property rights have to do with whether or not you have some claim that must be respected by other people over some some set of things in the world. It's it's not like it's not like a, a property good or a property bad. Now with this I come to the second part of my clarification, namely the libertarian implications <sighs> of the ethics of argumentation. For this, it is first necessary to point out the obvious fact that all argumentation has a propositional content. Whenever we argue, we argue about something. This can be argumentation itself, that is the very subject that I have been speaking about so far, um, but the content can be all sorts of things. Um, they can be matters of fact, or cause and effect, such as whether or not global warming presently exists and is man-made, or whether or not an increase in the money supply will lead to greater overall prosperity, but they can also be about normative matters, whether, such as whether or not the possession, the actual control of something by someone implies his rightful ownership of the thing in question, or if slavery or taxation are justified or not. In short, argumentation can be either about facts or it can be about norms. The source of an argumentation about facts is what I shall call a disagreement. And its purpose is to resolve this disagreement and effect a change to the better in one's own factual beliefs. Hang on, wait a second. Did he just involve the term he's defining in the definition of the term? About facts, or it can be about norms. The source of an argumentation about facts is what I shall call a disagreement. And its purpose is to resolve this disagreement and effect a change to okay, the source. So an argument about facts is to resolve a disagreement about facts. Better in one's own factual beliefs, so as to make actions motivated by these beliefs more successful in the future. The source of an argumentation about norms, on the other hand, is conflict. 
and its purpose is to resolve this conflict and affect a change in one's system of values so as to better avoid future conflict. In the original presentation of my argument... That doesn't follow. I can argue about norms again to make my opponent look disgusting before an audience such that he is brute-forced out of locuting that argument in future. In fact, that's, I think, overwhelmingly what does happen. I don't think for the most part people have arguments like this with the sincere aim of convincing their opponents, certainly not in front of a stage, like maybe in private. Um, but but in, in, on this medium, like when you're talking to a bunch of strangers, absolutely not. I was exclusively concerned about the second matter of normative justification, and this is also the central topic here, but I have to come to, have come to realize that in order to better understand the nature of an argumentation about norms, it is instructive to first look briefly by way of contrast at an argumentation about facts. How is a factual disagreement settled within an argumentative setting? Now that depends, of course, first on the subject matter of the disagreement and then on the methods, the actions and operations to be employed in order to come to a conclusion and decide between the rival truth claims under consideration. What methods are appropriate for a, for a given purpose? What, if anything, must be observed? How and under what circumstances? What needs to be measured and by means of what measuring standards or device? What other purposefully constructed tools, instruments, machines, and so forth Here we get must it. be at hand Stop repeating yourself. in working condition in order to gather the relevant data? Is there anything that must be counted or counted? Oh my god, man, get to the point. Must time and time lags be considered and time be measured? Must and can a controlled experiment be set up? Are we aiming to establish a correlation or are we looking for causation? Or is it a matter of meaning and understanding rather than measuring that is of concern? Is a matter of contention at all an empirical matter? Or is it a logical matter instead that must and can be settled by deductive reasoning or geometric, mathematical, or praxeological proof? Oh, for God's sake. And finally, when one has settled on the question which methods to choose for a given purpose, these methods, tools, and operations must be put into action and practiced. The relevant data must be actually collected and the measurements, calculations, experiments, tests, or proofs actually taken and performed so as to bring the initial disagreement to a possible conclusion. We have to verify facts to have disagreements solved about facts. Thank you for that, Herman. Now, what makes this endeavor of solving some factual disagreement an argumentative justification? First, and most obvious, both disputants Indeed, everyone concerned about the matter of contention must consider each other as another person, equally no, you independent don't. and each with his own separate physical body. No, you don't. No, you don't at all. No, you don't. Uh, for one, uh, you can have an argument ethically um, between corporate entities that don't regard one another as having their own separate body, that may be only separate from each other, from being at each other's throats, by a transient material fact, like maybe you're Athens laying siege to Milos, and at the moment, there is nothing you can do but talk, because the process of starving out the defenders takes time. And so maybe you're arguing to the end of expediting their destruction. That is... No person is to exercise physical control over any other person's body without his assent during the entire undertaking. Rather, each person acts and speaks on his own, so as to make it possible that everyone may arrive at the same resolution on his own. In no, pe people can be the persons of other people when they're arguing. They may argue on behalf of someone else. Uh, they may argue on behalf of someone else uh, clandestinely. Um, they may be paid off to argue a certain position. They may be very good at it. <sighs> Independently and autonomously. And then accept the conclusion as 
in his own self-interest, nor presumably is any person involved in the undertaking threatened, paid off, or bribed by any other to merely pretend to argue and pronounce instead, regardless of the outcome, a predetermined verdict. Oh, well, that's convenient. So we're just, we're just defining argumentation as uh, that thing that happens to fit my argument and solve all of its problems and fill all of its holes. That's not what an argument is, Hoppe. You're, you're not talking about argument. You're talking about argument from libertarian uh, predispositions with specific ethical ends in mind. You're arguing that libertarians who argue reveal their libertarian standpoint. Surprise. Now, while all of this is generally recognized and accepted as a matter of course by the scientific community, another requirement is often no, they don't. What are you yes. talking about? No, no, no. Like, 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 people can argue on behalf of labs findings that they themselves disagree with. That's not... In particular, this requirement that best brings out the crucial difference between factual and normative argumentation. Not only must everyone engaged in the endeavor of resolving some factual disagreement be equally respected and assured in his own personal bodily integrity to speak of an argumentation or argumenta argumentative justification. It is also necessary that each person must have equal access to all data and all means, implements, instruments, or tools methodically required to decide the question at hand, so that each person may perform the same action and operation and replicate the results on his own. Why? That is, if it is necessary in order to resolve some factual disagreement, for instance, to use paper and pencil, a yardstick, a clock, a calculator, a microscope, or a telescope, or simply some ground on which to stand and make one's observation, then no one may be denied access to such devices. Why? In fact, it would be contrary to the purpose of an argumentation about facts and hence entail a dialectic contradiction for any Why? one person to say f to anyone else, for instance... Why are you telling people what their purposes like are? ...regarding the height of this building or the speed of that car, and to bring this disagreement to a resolution, we need a yardstick and a clock, but I deny you access to a yardstick and a clock. But, and with this I come Says to who? my central concern, argumentation about normative matters that is of right and wrong. Hey, what, 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 if, uh, what if somebody has a PhD and all of the social clout that comes with that? Um, so that they can say something with a level of confidence that somebody who doesn't have that doesn't have. Like, do you have to now grant every single person uh, access and whatever facilities uh, make them able to, like, follow through on all of the studies of their interlocutor in order to make a contrary claim? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Hey, Google, be quiet. It would not entail a performative or dialectic contradiction if I denied you access to this or that instrument or tool or this or that standing room. If the source and content of our argumentation is a conflict rather than a mere disagreement. That is, if you and I have different and incompatible plans, interests and goals regarding the instruments, tools, and standing room in question, then my refusal to permit you access to this or that may be justified or maybe not justified, but it would not in itself be a self-contradictory demand. What if we have different, what if we have a conflict over the uses of argument, Hans? Now, it is, characteristic, it is a characteristic mark of an argumentation about facts that for the duration... President Sunday, I recommend that you check out David Friedman's Machinery of Freedom and his videos. 
if you want an actual challenging and engaging version of anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism. I'll give that a look. Thank you. Um, at some point, that actually would be uh, that would be interesting. I hear he also talks to YouTubers. That could be uh, that could be an interesting connection. I don't know how that would go, but I can think of a few people I would like to have on with me um, where that would actually be possibly quite productive. Of the argumentation, a harmony of interests among all participating parties must prevail. Why? All property disputes are temporarily suspended. And also the outcome of the argumentation has no consequences or repercussions for the subsequent distribution of property. To bring a factual disagreement to a conclusion, every actual or potential participant must perform and is expected by everyone else to perform the same actions and operations with the same or the similar kind of objects. As long as the argumentation lasts, everyone does what everyone else expects and wants him to do. All act in harmony with one another, and at the end, after some at least temporary conclusion has been reached, everyone, with his newly learned lesson, returns back to his normal life, in which everyone, everything else, remains and stays the same way as before. Yet in this normal life, then, people do not only encounter factual disagreements. Indeed, as an empirical matter, at least in the life of an adult person, factual disagreements giving rise to argumentation are comparatively rare because the most fundamental and elementary facts about the composition and the inner workings of the external world are long recognized, accepted, and taken for granted by everyone in his daily life so as to never rise to the level of serious doubt. Really? So there aren't massive disputes about teaching evolution in public schools uh, about the, the shape of the planet? About the existence and or deadliness of global pandemics? Like, And if and whenever any serious doubt concerning the truth value of some factual claim does arise, such disagreements are generally routinely and methodically brought to some at least temporary settlement and accepted quickly and without any resistance by all interested party. Rather than factual disagreements then, it is the experience of conflicts that motivates most serious argumentation. And it is argumentation about conflicts that generates our most intense interests. Now, conflicts arise whenever two actors want and try to use one and the same physical means, the same body, the same standing room, the same external objects for the attainment of different goals. That is, when their interests regarding such means are not harmonious but incompatible or antagonistic. Two actors cannot at the same time use the same physical means for alternative purposes. If they try to do so, they must clash. Only one person's will... I mean, maybe, maybe you conflict because you're just trying to destroy each other because there's something about each other you just hate, and it's not about scarcity. Maybe this isn't purpose in that direction, but he doesn't seem to... He doesn't seem to give a reason for why that wouldn't be... The, wouldn't be like among the reasons for conflict. Or that of another person can prevail, but not both. Whenever we argue with one another about matter of conflicts then, we demonstrate that it is our purpose to find a peaceful argumentative solution to some given conflict. We have agreed not to fight, but to argue instead. And we demonstrate as well that we are willing to respect the outcome of our trial of arguments. Indeed, to argue otherwise and say, for instance, let us not fight, but argue whose will is to prevail in our conflict. But at the end of our argumentation, and irrespective of the outcome, I will fight you anyway, would entail a performative or dialectic contradiction. 
to say so contradicts the very purpose of argumentation. Well, no, it contradicts the purpose of one party's of, of one party to that argumentation. But the purpose of the other party may have simply been to defeat you by a less costly means, and then when that fails, they were always going to fall back on that anyways. There, that, there's no contradiction there. Um, and you, you can't derive from that um, a principle denying the right of one party to do so, because it's you're, you're relying again on the fact that they have a specific purpose that they patently do not, in order to tell them, like, ah, ah, you're at odds with yourself. And even then, so what? Like, who, who, who on earth has been motivated to not do something they don't want to do because it contradicts themselves? Typically, there has to be something of weight, right? Not just a fetish for, like, checking all the same boxes at every turn. The task faced by any opponent and proponent engaged in an argumentation about conflict then is to find a peaceful resolution not only for the conflict at hand, but also for all potential future conflicts, so as to be able to interact henceforth with one another in a conflict-free and peaceful manner, despite and notwithstanding each other's differing interests, whether now or in the future. The definitive answer to this problem is provided by a brief analysis of the logic of action, that is, by method of praxeological reasoning. Logically, to avoid all future interpersonal conflict, it is only necessary that every good, every physical thing employed as a means in the pursuit of human ends, be always and at all times owned privately, that is, be controlled exclusively by one specific person or voluntary partnership or association rather than another, and that it be always recognizable and clear which good is owned by whom and which is not or owned by someone else. That's completely unrelated to everything that's come, come before. He's just re-articulating some Lockean idea of uh, there, there needs to be a distinction between public and private and respect for uh, public property or respect for uh, private property in order to uh, retain peace and harmony in society. Like that's that's not, not nothing of what came before here had any bearing on this, and that has no bearing on what came before. And the Lockean idea of property is is radically distinct from what he's talking about. It's not just the bare fact that you abstractly own something. Um, Lockean property treats property as like an extension of your body. This is why there's a limitation of property at the point where you can no longer like make use of the stuff that you own legally. Like if you have like Jeff Bezos, an amount of wealth that you actually can't spend. Um, that's not properly speaking your property in a metaphysical sense or, or in like some ontological sense, I guess. Because... It, it has no actual concrete relationship with your uh, with your agency. It's now just a mass, like a tumor that just exists. Like if you think about it, like even the matter that you're made of, like most of your body you can't feel. It's your nervous system that uh, that is the that you know g gives you sensations up here. It's kind of creepy when you think about it. Like, you don't actually feel your fingers or your skin or anything like that. You have organs inside of them that perceive pressure and heat and cold and all that kind of thing. Um, but nonetheless, because, like, th these are all, like, uh, necessarily connected, uh, they're necessarily under your power um, in, in, like, a specific kind of way. Not not simply, like, in a, uh, in a dormant way, but always under your power. Um... Like you don't simply have a right to them; they're actually like, they're actually yours. Then uh, they're your property, sort of like how uh, your field that you till and whatnot. Like you have a direct relationship between that and a thing that happens. You can manipulate it in real time to produce things. You you mix your labor with the land such that, in a sense, you've actually extended your arm into it. Something like that.
th this has nothing whatsoever to do with like what what sorts of presumptions you have to transiently make in order to sustain a conversation with someone in which you disagree about excuse me sorry about some topic or um or, or about some fact or norm then the interests the plans and the purposes of different actors can be as different as may as they can be and yet no conflict will arise between them as long as their actions involve exclusively the use of their own private property and leave the property of others alone and physically intact. Yes, people won't conflict if they don't conflict. Thank you, Hans. But this is only part of the answer. Because then immediately the next question arises of how to accomplish such a complete and unambiguous privatization of all economic goods peacefully. That is, without generating and leading itself to conflict. How can physical things become someone's private property in the first place? This doesn't matter. Okay, uh, I'm going to call it here. All right, do I want to call it? I'll give it five more minutes. I have to go to a thing, but I'll, I'll go for five more minutes, then I'll run. And how can interpersonal conflict in the appropriation of physical things be avoided? Now, praxeological analysis also yields, yields a conclusive answer to these questions. For one, to avoid conflict, it is necessary that the appropriation of things as means is affected through actions rather than through mere words, declarations, or decrees. What? Why? Because only through a person's actions taking place at a particular place and time can an objective and intersubjectively ascertainable link between a particular person and a particular thing and ex in its extension and boundary be established and hence can rival ownership claims be settled in an objective manner. Okay, that's that's dumb. I'm I'm calling it here. There's there's nothing. There's nothing here, guys. There is nothing here. Ugh. I have to go to a thing. So, I'm I'm going to call it here. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was a thing. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sitting through this. God knows why. Take care.